Well, we're going to go from here, Jim, because it is now five o'clock. So we are going to call the uh, Tuesday, June 23rd Park Board meeting to order. And uh, Rebecca, would you please take the roll? Davis. Here. Facto. Here. Bogus. Here. Bremner. Here. Potter. Here. Thompson. Here. Woodard. Here. Bollard. Here. Bill Main. Here. Lohmeyer. She's muted. Farah. Lohmeyer. Here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, I can now. Okay. Banter. Here. Did I miss anybody? Uh, you missed, did you get uh, Sayers, Anderson, and Bogus? I know they're not on, but did you call them? I did not. Okay. Kimberly's here. Aren't you, Kimberly? Yep, yep. I called her. Okay. All right. We have a quorum, so let's look at the uh, agenda as presented and see if there anyone has anything to add to it, or do we need to amend it in any way? I'll move it. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. That's, appro that's approved. We're going to go right to the minutes of the May 26th Park Board meeting. That's May 26, 2020. Any questions on that? Any uh, concerns regarding the minutes? I'll move the minutes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The minutes have been approved. So with that, we'll go right into board action. And the board first action is the election of officers. And uh, the committee, the uh, subcommittee has uh, approved Bill Thompson for vice chair and board members of the executive board is Andrea Woodard, Sarah Lohmeyer, and Jim Bollard. Any discussion on that? Rebecca, would you please call the roll? Davis? Yes. Facto? Yes. Bogus? Yes. Bremner? Yes. Potter? Yes. Thompson? Yes. Woodard? Yes. Bollard? Yes. Bill Main? Yes. Lohmeyer? Yes. Banter? Yes. Election of officers passes. And with that, we can go to receive and file. I do want to say we have some board members that this will be their last meeting of attendance. And when I talked with Rebecca, I forgot to put that down. So after the receive and file, we will uh, honor those people that this would be their uh, last board meeting with us. But moving forward, let's go to receive and file. Ben, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. We have a really straightforward agenda tonight that I think goes rather quick. So feel free to stop us and slow us down and ask questions if you have them. But first up is Colby Fangman. Uh, you all had received an email from me, and you may have even caught some news media coverage of our park score. We started that two years ago, the top 100 largest cities by population get to be in the park score for at no cost. There is a catch. There is a lot of staff work involved to fill out the documentation it takes to be scored. Uh, two years ago, again, Richard Brown was helping us with this project. We were essentially 104th. We found out that it was four cities after about four years of us wanting to be in this that weren't participating. So we convinced them since they weren't doing it, let us in. Let's see it. Let's see, let's see where we rank. And you'll see, you'll recall that we were at 39th. Without stealing too much thunder from Colby Fangman, who's taken this project on, I'll let him give you a quick presentation to show you a little bit more behind the scenes what goes into this, hopefully give you a better understanding of why, how the information is collected, what we collect, and then how it's used. So without further ado, Colby, uh, take it away. <laughs> All right, I, I just attempted to share my screen. Uh, go ahead and let me know if uh, that's working. It's working. All right. 
Uh, Chair Davis and members of the Park and Recreation Board, thank you for having me here tonight. My name is Colby Fangman. I'm a park planner with the department. Um, and I'm going to talk, talk through the 2020 City of Des Moines Park Score ranking results. Uh, without further ado, let's go. Let's see. All right. There we go. All right, so Park Score, what is it? Um, the Trust for Public Land is a national nonprofit that um, basically works in park and recreation, you know, it, with a large scale parks and recreation, and they developed what's called the Park Score Index. Um, they consider it to be the most comprehensive evaluation of park access and quality in the 100 largest US cities. Um, based upon our own assessment, uh, we would completely agree. It is very comprehensive, great program. Um, there are key assessment elements. There's four key items, each worth 100 points apiece. Um, there's, acre, there's acreage, so your average park size is 50 points, and then the percent of park land within the city area is also 50 points. There's investment, so spending per capita, you know, dollars per person we spend. Um, amenities, an average score of six key amenities, and that looks at basketball hoops, dog parks, playgrounds, recreation and senior centers, public restrooms and spray grounds. And then lastly, access, <laughs> percent of <laughs> population living in, oop, get all the feedback, percent of population living within a 10 minute walk. And that category looks at population density, youth density, as well as low and medium income density. All right, so what does a park score look like? Uh, basically, it's there's a map sheet and a, and a company da accompanying data sheet. Um, what you're see what you're seeing is a city of Des Moines with uh, our basically our park score service area ratings. Um, in the full green, you're seeing the basically the parklands layer. In the mint the lighter green or mint green, you're seeing our service areas. And then the warm the warm colors are levels of park need, with red being very high and your kind of cream cream orange being moderate. Um, so. A, a scale of moderate to very high. Um, accompanying this, we also get a, a sheet um, which looks more at the data metrics. Um, as you can see, uh, we ended we ended our 2020 score was uh, 34th. Um, so we moved up five uh, positions in the ranking with a total park score of 60.7. Um, just wanted to give you a quick overview of this. Um, we have some interesting or better, funner images to look at later in the presentation. But um, just wanted to call out some notable areas that we gained in the investment category or spending, um, senior recreation centers, <laughs> spray grounds, and service area were all areas of gains this year. All right, now looking at our performance history, uh, in 2019, we were ranked 39th. Uh, to call out a couple kind of in front of us and behind us, uh, I see Austin, Texas down there in 43rd. And uh, I see Omaha, Nebraska in 36th. And then moving to the 2020 ranking, you'll see Omaha is down here at 38th. So we leapfrogged them, uh, go, go Des Moines Parks and Rec. And uh, we are now in 34th. And uh, um, what one of the cities I've called out in a future slide is actually Kansas City, Missouri as kind of a, a, a regional benchmark and also a, a target for us to leapfrog over the next few years. So here's our side-by-side -side comparison between um, 2019 and 2020. Uh, really, it's hard to pick out what the big differences are. So I've, I've cross-compared these two, and really the, the big gain that we made was related to uh, the access agreement with Weeks Middle School. As you can see, the black dashed area right here, um, that was all previously high or very high. So that was, a, that was a, you know, looking citywide, that's a notable service area pickup. So that was a good gain. Uh, here we're looking at a bar chart and um, scatter plot of our 2020 results with access, investment, acreage, and amenities being color coded. Um, so you can kind of see where our strengths and weaknesses are. Um, so as you can see, we also have Kansas City and Des Moines benchmarked over here. So access, we're right in kind of the same area as Kansas City. Um, investment, uh, we have a little bit to catch up with them, but we are right in the middle of the pack at the 50 percentile. Um, acreage, we're, we're out front. Um, we're really only seeing a few other communities that are ahead of us in that category. So that, that should be a point of pride for us. And then amenities, we're, we're a little about 55th percentile ahead of Kansas City, uh, but room to grow. 
Um, so just kind of an interesting look uh, where we fall within the overall mix. Now getting down to some specific items. Uh, again, these were our top four categories. How are we doing in all these areas? So access, 55 out of 100. Acreage, 82 out of 100, doing very well there. Investment, 50 out of 100. And amenities, 56 out of 100. So fairly middle of the pack um, for three out of the four categories outside of acreage. So we have 70 residents living within, or 70% of residents living within a 10 minute walk of a park uh, with a nationwide average at 55%. So again, this is why uh, we're doing fairly well in that access category, as well as um, our, our acreage. You know, Having lots of park land is part of the reason we can provide good access. So looking at, again, at access, looking a little closer at demographics, you'll notice that among the, our age groups here, <laughs> Uh, we have a very equal spread in service and same by, um, by income. So children, adults, seniors, all within that 69 to 71% range, um, low, medium, high income, 69 to 72. So very, very equal there as well. Um, and then looking at um, race or ethnicity, uh, very similarly, um, lining very similar service percentages across all um, ethnic groups. So. What this is pointing to is that we actually have a very egalitarian system um, on our hands. So that's really good, good news for us. And again, a point of pride. So moving on to the amenities. Um, so basketball hoops, we're in the 40th percentile. So that we've got a lot of area we can grow there. And it's, uh, you know, for the investment, it's a, it's a good spot. <laughs> For dog parks, we're in the 60th percentile, so doing fairly well. However, um, room to grow, and depending on the size of the dog park, that can be a um, low to moderate investment for the points. Playgrounds, we're right about in the middle of the pack with the 47th percentile. Uh, bathrooms, we're at the 50th, 58th percentile, so again, a, a little above average there. For recreation and senior centers, we're at the 54th percentile, so doing well there as, as well, or ahead of average. And then for splash pad spray grounds, we are in the 95th percentile. So um, great item to be proud of. Uh, no reason to take our foot off on the gas on those. They're a great, great feature for the community. Um, then looking at opportunities for future growth. Um, so we already looked at the you know, the service access area gains we made from Weeks Middle School. However, this year we'll be adding a basketball facility and playground facility. So that'll boost us in the amenities points. Um, we're also looking at some early land acquisitions for the Carlisle Trail Connection, looking at uh, um, acquiring a greenway corridor for that project. Um, there's also the restroom addition at the Lourdes and Skate Park. And then other trail and park footprint additions. Uh, we have the Cohen Park uh, Collaborative Stormwater Project that we're going to develop. Um, similar type project on for Brook Run and uh, Southwest First Street Bridge. That's that's only ever been looked at as a uh, trail pass through, and now we want to start looking at it as actual parkland surface area. Uh, and then we have a potential item in the Hamilton drainage area up in the related to a Highland Park area sewer project. And then just an overall audit of uh, expanding footprints to all the areas we mow and manage to make sure that uh, we get credit for the operations that we're doing. Um, that's, that's the gist of the presentation. Um, very pleased to be working on this or very proud to be working on this project and look forward to continue working on it. Uh, from here, I would, uh, Thank Chair Davis and the Park and Recreation Board for your time and open it up for any questions. Uh, I, I have, have a one... question. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a question, Colby. I wonder if the restroom addition to the Luritzen Skate Park uh, would be done by the county. It will be, but it's a public restroom, so it counts within the overall inventory. Okay. Yeah. So part of the program, they, they look at your local public partners. Um, so for example, um, some of the Polk County senior meal sites are also within our recreation center counts. Um, so they, they, want, they look at the overall mix of public amenities, understanding that there's give and take in who provides what service. Okay, thank you. Yep. I had a question when, was, was uh, McGray Park amenities in this in this report that went in 
the as far as the land area as far as um well as far as uh you know the the different amendments that, so it, the, I, must, I'm, I don't I'm, I must not be wording that very well but we put in some uh oh we lost it george <laughs> I think so he's the asking. Time you're ever going to see George being quiet, everybody. I think he's asking, are there amenities that we added with the upgrades to the park that are not included yet? So with with McRae, my goodness, um, I thought we were top drawer there. And, and so one of the things can you hear me now? We can. Yep. So they they have to develop a system that they can. In McRae, we have some Am very I unique. Out um, right now. Oop. We got you, George. Yep. Oh, now you're muted. Oh, you need to talk to your service provider, George. Yeah. We'll talk to <laughs> um, so I guess the enclosed shelter at McRae would definitely be a part of that. Uh, it would be within our trail calculations that looked into it. And the park is our existing parkland. So that would have been considered. Um, and we do have some unique amenities out at, out at McRae. However, for unique or specialized features, those are hard to consider within this larger index because they have to develop a system that they can apply equally to all 100 um, evaluation candidates. And there's, there's even some things in the way they assess the 10 minute walk. Um, they actually use the street grid. Um, so there's a few areas where I think we have better access than the system shows. However, they, they have to stick to the system they developed in order to equally assess um, all, all those participating. I, I hope that speaks to your, the question, George. How about other questions while George reboots? <laughs> so, so Colby, um, wh where would the Reno Dog Park be relative to its state when you filed these papers? Is it gonna get bigger than what was filed currently or? So the interesting feature about dog parks is that is a count. It is not a land area calculation. Um, so Reno Dog Park would have been, actually the, I believe it would have been the prior Reno that went in with this submission uh, because you have to submit kind of the, you know, in the winter season. Um, so new Reno would, would have yet to be developed. But we will get additional trail connection there. Yes, the neighborhood. yes. So Good that question. should that should expand service area definitely. Thank you. I think we've done so many great things. It's just, you know, where do you predict this next year? I'd love to see us leapfrog Kansas City. I would. I'd really love it. A little internal goal we have. Um, I told Kobe he gets to retire. We hit number one. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna let him out in two years. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> Show us the money. We'll make it happen. That's right. <laughs> All it takes right now is money. But yeah, I, I believe internally we're looking at slow strategic growth with this. So that, that's the goal. Yeah. I we, would say this to the board. This is another tool in the toolbox for us to be analytical about where we add new parks at. Obviously, we have one major goal from our comp plan is to reinvest in the neighborhood parks, among other things, and focus on what we have. But as opportunities avail themselves, we don't want to put parks next to parks that are already served well for the neighborhood. We want to take parks and put them in places where people don't have access today. And that red, green, yellow, white map is really a tool that we'll continue to use. You so, know, we have uh, some people that are um, listening to the board meeting also. And, and do we have any public questions? While you're waiting for that, I have another question, George. So it's not just about the score, but is there any low-hanging fruit that scores in this um, that we need to look at? That was that last slide that I think we're looking at for next year. Can, we, can you go back to that slide? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So a number of these already in the docket and planned, um, but as, as far as, you know, in, in – categories that were scoring lower and we've had some internal discussions you know this this type of amenity costs this versus this but 
you know, push comes to shove, the I don't think the decisions are being made based upon gaining points here. Right. Um, we're trying to do the right thing and gain points. <laughs> if you see 12 dog parks built next year, just look the other way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and that is some of the strategic things we look at. You know, they, they don't look at the area of the dog park. It's a simple quantity count. So that's an interesting thing. So like at Ewing, do you count that as one or two? One. Yep. Reno, Reno is one. Uh, Riverwalk is one. So yeah, for, for, for the large, I, I would assume some of our competitors have a series of smaller dog parks uh, in comparison to our large, nice dog parks. Right. But technically at Ewing, it's a, a, a large dog park and a small dog park, right? I mean, they're separated. That's why I asked the question. Interesting idea. We'll have to look at that and see what the rules say, Jim. That's a good, a good question. That is a good suggestion. Thank you. Anything else, board? I just want to say thanks, Colby, for taking it on because doing the data in the background to make these things happen is not always the most fun to do. So thank you for compiling it and getting it pulled together and, and agreeing to or volunteering to do this because I think it it bodes well for our park system. Uh, very happy to. I, I love the analytical uh, geographic analysis type stuff. So pleased to be working on this project. And uh, and I think, you know, there's there's still areas where we're trying to still gain the credit we deserve um, within the data. So if there are no other comments, I'll move to receive and file. I'll, I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Colby. Receive a file passes. Colby, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank all of you for your questions. Uh, I enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay, moving on. Part C, uh, Recreation Summer Happenings Presentation. Yes, uh, Matt Kelswich is going to give you an update of what's moving forward, and obviously there'll be some themes to how we manage new recreational programs during COVID-19 times, but I thought it would be best to give you what we would normally do this year, the summer happenings and a little bit of the teaser on the fall happenings. So Matt, without further ado, we'll ask you to share your screen. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Give me just a moment here. Am I up? Can you see yes, that you now? Yes, you are. You're good now. Excellent. Thank you. Chair Davis, members of the Park and Recreation Board, Matt Kalsevich, Recreation Manager. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm very excited to bring information to you regarding the 2020 Recreation Summer Happenings. So I wanted to start with a lot of what will be a theme here with the program offerings that we're coming back to uh, this summer. And we really are calling a lot of those our return to play guidelines. And so many of these are things you're seeing out in the community with other activities reactivating. And certainly our guidelines are following a lot of these same protocols. First and foremost is our call to maintain proper social distance, social distancing of six feet or more. That's on a lot of our signage and a lot of the information that's going out ahead of time to participants. The next focus is sanitizing of equipment and facilities. Much of this is done by our staff, but a lot of this uh, may happen with participants and it's a call for them to be conscious of this as well. On the heels of that is washing hands before and after participating. Again, recommendation that's out there in regards to use of our playgrounds and spray grounds and something that'll be part of our uh, official program offerings as well. And then certainly a reminder to stay home when experiencing symptoms of illness. Uh, we have protocols in place for our staff and our city team, but we're asking participants and patrons to be sensitive to that as well, especially as we organize activities, bringing people back into a central environment. And then last but not least, we want to recommend to people anytime they're registered for a program or they're investigating information about a program to check our website and our social media for additional updates about program guidelines. Certainly, as we go along, the things could change. 
Uh, they could become less, they could become more. Certain activities could have different requirements that others won't. Uh, and then you'll see during the presentation, the broad scope of offerings. And so we want people to be as aware and, and as in touch with those details as possible. I'll start with some of our adult sports and uh, athletic programs. One of the staple programs of most of our summer seasons going back quite a long way is our adult softball league. This is one that was scheduled to start a little earlier, but obviously with some of the restrictions and delays, got bumped back to the time frame that you see here now. This is players 18 and older. We have a registration deadline of July 1st, and a lot of our programs reset to that July 1st date a few weeks ago as things started to trend toward us being allowed to reactivate some of our activities, facilities, and programs. The season now is scheduled to start July 6th and run through October 18th. Still opportunity to have a lot of participation with seven and 14 game schedules and that $390 per team fee. We will be at the Greater Des Moines Softball Complex. One of the great advantages of that facility for those of you who've been there, there's a lot of space to spread out. So we certainly feel good about being able to allow people to come back to that spot and accomplish a lot of what I mentioned in the first slide. Next is our Summer Adult Bags League. Uh, this will again be for players 18 and older, registration deadline of July 1st, and you can see some of the details there on the season. This has been a tremendous success the last few years in the summer and the fall, numbers increasing in those programs uh, each of the last few seasons. We'll once again be at the downtown hub spot. Those are the images, the pictures you see there on the right. So wonderful location for a program like this. One of the special guidelines with uh, the program for this season is participants are being encouraged to bring their own bags. Again, trying to look at some of the sanitary things that we're doing, some of the touch points for uh, cross-contamination. Uh, and if people have the ability to do that, uh, we invite them to do so. Next is our summer pickleball program for adults. This is a relatively new program. We had the opportunity to potentially run things in the spring, but that schedule was affected by some of the COVID guidelines. A lot of you know, and it's the images on the right-hand side, we host a large indoor pickleball program, but this is projected to be outdoors as we've added several pickleball courts across the community and our parks. And uh, when we've done, redone tennis courts in the last five or six years, we've done so with the addition of pickleball lines. So we're looking at a season to start here in mid-July. Again, a registration deadline of July 1st. There's a fee for a team or per individual. And you can see the locations we're looking to use as part of this season as well. Again, spread out throughout our system. And one of the special guidelines here, similar to that of what I just mentioned with bags, players must bring their own equipment. Again, a, a touch point limitation that we won't be providing that for participants. We think a lot of the people who'd be interested in this program would be bringing their own materials and equipment anyway. Next is with Grays Lake concessions and rentals. We know a lot of you keep up with our information on social media, and you'll know then that we opened back on June 15th, so just over a week ago now, and we're intending to be open through Labor Day. This is 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily, and we have watercraft rental at $8 for a half hour and $15 for an hour. So what you'll notice from past seasons that's not here is our bike rental. One of the casualties or one of the limitations, if you will, of this time as our traditional or historical bike vendor was not able to uh, equip us with the same thing they had in the past. It was another place where we felt like it was acceptable to reduce service uh, a little bit um, because of the reduction of, of touch points and procedure to sanitize equipment. But we're still very happy to be offering the watercraft rental. Some of the special guidelines here are life jackets must be worn and those will be sanitized between use. And only members of the same household can be on a boat. Again, trying to limit the way that people would interact with each other through the use of our program. I will mention that we do have prepackaged concessions available. So water, Gatorade, soda, candy bars, things of that nature. So again, still part of the service we normally provide there, um, just in some uh, with some deeper regulations to ensure safety and sanitation. Another wonderful aspect of the Gray's Lake programming is our stand-up paddleboarding, and this has grown and been very popular over the last few years. Two different offerings that we bring again this summer. First is the introduction to stand-up paddleboard that we have coming up here on July 11th at 9 a.m. and then August 20th at 5 p.m. Trying to offer things during different times of the summer and then even at different times of the day to allow people to find the optimal time for them to come and connect with us. 
That class, because it does offer some additional instruction, is $25 per person. The stand-up paddleboard with the naturalist are offered on the dates that you see there below, one coming up here on June 24th, two in July, and three in August. And that's typically geared toward a more experienced paddleboard uh, user uh, and just $10 a person. That's a great course with our environmental education supervisor, Joel Van Ruckel, uh, and his knowledge and expertise of Gray's Lake. Uh, so we definitely encourage people, if they want to learn more about that location, to take advantage of this potential program. Speaking of Gray's Lake and Joel and his opportunity to engage there, he's provided a new event this year called Paddle and Pickup. So again, those of you on the board I know are well versed about some of the things that changed this year. And one of the things that were canceled was our Earth Day Trash Bash. Well, there's still a need to attend to some of the areas of Gray's Lake that have typically collected trash. So on Saturday, June 27th, uh, we'll do a Gray's Lake Shoreline Pickup. That'll be at 10 a.m. with pre-registration required because there is limited availability on the number of boats that we'll actually be able to access and provide uh, for this service. Second will be at the uh, Grays Lake Terrace building just above uh, the concession stand. In that picture on the right, uh, Joel is the tallest member of that group. Uh, back in 2014, worked with our iEarth Camp um, through the Science Center of Iowa. And that, court, that class has gone virtual this year. Uh, to provide a similar service. So another opportunity just to jump in and do a new program uh, and help us with a, a, a need to clean up the lake and the surrounding area. Next is another long time running program with our environmental education and that's Plant Grow Fly. So on Tuesday, June 30th, there will be a curbside pickup for these materials and an opportunity to engage with this program. Now this is an alternative uh, to events canceled uh, due to COVID-19, but we're partnering with the library for this curbside pickup service, and then we'll be doing Zoom conferencing. Uh, Joel, who I just mentioned, will be connecting back with these participants to educate them about the project, about the way they're going to um, hopefully be able to take advantage of things at home. Obviously, part of our effort to support uh, monarch butterfly migration. So we're glad that we were still able to use these materials and offer this opportunity to the community, even though we'll be doing it in a little different way than we have in the past. Next is our star party. And this is a long time running event. We're entering uh, our potential ninth year of providing this. And again, as I just mentioned, partnership with the Science Center of Iowa, they're a key uh, provider for this program. Right now, we're scheduled for Saturday, August 15th, with activities starting at 6 p.m., once again at the Ewing Park Lilac Arboretum. So with much of the summer and, and a lot of the uncertainty that was happening in the early part and still some things unknown, uh, the Science Center is still trying to bring back a lot of what um, they unfortunately had to um, shut down for a portion of time. So we're still trying to just make sure we can put together everything here uh, as we've offered in the past. And we'll keep the board uh, updated on if things change. One of the other aspects of this event has been a, a free flicks movie. And going into this season, we uh, identified the Lego movie two, the second part as the movie we would show at this event right now. And I'll talk more about free flicks here in a moment. The traditional offering of free flicks for this season, again, due to limitations and regulations because of COVID-19 has been canceled. But if there's a way to perhaps maybe provide something similar uh, or a modification of that to still have this be part of the event, we'll let people know about that and we'll do our best to make it happen. Another new event that is exciting to share with you um, is our Shinrin-yoku forest therapy. And I say new uh, in the sense that it really has only happened one other time. So it's still relatively fresh in terms of the offerings that we're able to provide uh, through Des Moines Park and Recreation. And so the idea of this is really to help people to go out and engage in nature and specifically the forest areas right here in our community to really help them kind of clear their mind and connect with their thoughts and use this unique environment to have that be something that really strengthens their connection with themselves and the community. In this case, we're going to be offering this class, this therapy class on Thursday, August 27th at 5.30 at Beaverdale Park. There's a cost of $20. This is a unique partnership with Warren County Conservation Board. And obviously a lot of you know, we do a lot with Polk County Conservation. Warren County, one of their partners came to us with the opportunity to expand this offering. We were excited to bring it to Des Moines and hopefully have that many more people enjoy it uh, this year uh, as we did fill up the class um, last fall when we offered it for the first time. 
next is some information about our community recreation centers. Again, going back to some of the information we've shared already on social media, many of you know that the Pioneer Columbus Community Recreation Center reopened on June 15th. That was for youth and adult drop-in play only, no official programs yet at that facility. We do have some modified rules in place as well as some capacity limitations. So there's only a, a four allowed in the weight room at, the at a time, 10 allowed in the gym. Uh, so again, easing back into our opportunity to use that space in some of the traditional ways we have. Uh, so we just, again, want to be conscious, cautious about the way we would invite people to reconnect and, and reintegrate into a facility, an enclosed facility like the Community Recreation Center. So far, it's been a good start and people have appreciated our effort. The other facility to mention is the Four Mile Community Recreation Center. And going back to some social media information that was shared uh, a short while back, you know that we're doing a renovation that began there in May uh, with anticipated completion in the fall of this year. That image down on the right shows you a little bit of the work they're doing to add fire suppression, to reconfigure the facility, uh, use some of the spaces that have really sat dormant for the last few years to make them program space or rental space. Uh, and just really bring a new life to that facility. One of the major changes is relocating the weight room from the back of the facility to the front right near the entrance and across from uh, the staff check-in desk, which we think will just be a wonderful uh, way to engage more with participants and allow them to feel even that much more comfortable participating in that kind of activity. Next is our yoga from the park. And many of you might know this as yoga in the park, but we're enjoying this in a different way this year, in an exciting new way that's actually, I think, engaged quite a few new people. So this is the 11th season that we've been able to offer yoga to the community through Des Moines Parks and Recreation. This year, we're scheduled to do that on Saturdays at 9 a.m. from June 6th through September 26th. And what is new this year is that the classes are being provided online via Facebook and YouTube. So virtual opportunity is so many activities and programs have gone that direction here, not just with Des Moines Park and Rec, but across the, the state and the country. Uh, this is free to access. Uh, and I can tell you that the numbers have uh, jumped up quite a bit in the first three weeks where we were in the 200s uh, to the 400s. And this last week, we had 688 views on Facebook. So I think people are really enjoying the opportunity to experience this at home. And it's our intent to continue to offer it this way until maybe some things change where we can have a better situation to invite people back to the park and we'll certainly let people know uh, if things do change. But for now, very excited about this being uh, what we're bringing now to the community. I believe we're the first to do this virtually. Uh, so again, very proud of the fact that we were able to achieve that and, and touch the people that we have so far through this new iteration of the program. Next is our free flicks or potential drive-in movies. Gave you a little indication of what had happened here. And again, some of you have seen information that we've shared already about the modifications here. So again, social distancing guidelines, regulation about uh, uh, large group gatherings really restricted the way that we would able, were able to provide free flicks uh, as we have traditionally over the summer. So that series as it was set was canceled. It is our intent to return to that series again down the road and we'll keep people informed about that. Right now we're exploring a drive-in movie schedule or an alternative uh, to viewing movies outdoors. More information will be posted on our website and social media as we establish that information. We certainly want to thank the community for their patience. We know this is an exciting, fun, unique part of our summer schedule, uh, and it's taking a little time just to make sure we're able to offer this in the um, safest, best way uh, for the community to come back and enjoy this with us. Wanted to highlight another virtual program, speaking of what I did with yoga, and again, so many of the things that wonderful program providers are doing across the community and the country. We've come up with a new program to really help people get outside and chart some of their fitness success as they're enjoying the summer. This is 31 Miles Your Way, and our special events supervisor, Laura Murphy, uh, was the creator of this program and brought us a wonderful opportunity to just, again, help people get outside. So we have this virtual event to track 31 miles in 31 days. And the Your Way is doing that either by running, biking, or swimming. And we know people have the different ways they do things. And in all honesty, if you have another way you enjoy your recreation, that could be part of this total too, because we really want to people, encourage people to do what they do uh, and they're most comfortable doing to participate in this program. So officially, the program is running the 31 days of July. 
This is for ages five and up. I will tell you that it is out there now. So if you're wanting to get a jump on things, check it out on our Facebook page and we'll think you enjoy the opportunity to um, get out, especially on a nice weather day like today or the next few that we're gonna see. So if you wanna get ahead on things, go ahead. $10 per participant, complete the 31 miles and receive a program t-shirt. You can see the design and the logo for the program on the right with a couple images of our trail system. We certainly think people who sign up for this program will do a lot of um, their miles, log a lot of their miles through our trails. Finally, I wanna wrap up with our aquatics information. And again, for those of you who are on our social media and keep up with that, you saw a post today with some up-to-date detail and information about what we're gonna be able to bring to you this summer uh, through Des Moines Parks and Recreation. So I'll start with the big one, and that's our open public swim opportunity. Biggest change for this year that you saw on the social media information earlier is that we're going to be running things only at three pools, uh, Birdland, Nahas, and Teachout. So there was a strategic approach to really trying to identify three pools that spread that service um, throughout the city. Um, so Birdland, very centrally located, Teach Out on the east side, Nahas on the south side. Uh, and they have amenities and services that allowed us to still do things in a, a fairly complete way for only being able to manage three facilities. One of the other limitations of starting a little later with our aquatic season was uh, the loss of potential staff. And we're doing well at this point in terms of covering things at three facilities, but going beyond that was going to be a, a, an intense challenge. So we've landed on this here uh, for the 2020 season. One of the other factors, and again, going back to guidelines and, and procedures, policies that are, are city-based as well as CDC and Iowa Department of Health, we're going to limit the number of people in the facility, any of these three facilities at any one time, to just 200 uh, person maximum capacity. So once we reach that 200 person limit, when four people exit, four more people would be allowed to come in. And that would be our cycle through these open swim times. I can tell you, uh, show you Monday through Friday, 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. will be the first session on weekdays, and that'll be the $4 for adult, $2 for children. And then we actually have an evening session that follows our uh, late swim lessons. And I'll talk about those here shortly from 7 to 8.30 p.m. So again, speaking to a group here that is very knowledgeable about how things have progressed and our planning for the future, this actually looks a lot like uh, some discussions we had earlier this year about maybe the future offerings at our aquatic facilities for an afternoon and evening open swim sessions. Uh, that evening session is actually uh, half the rate, $2 for adults, $1 for child. And typically, again, historically, we've cut our fee in half after 5 p.m. And that'll be the case in our Saturday and Sunday open swim offerings, Saturday 1 to 6.30 p.m and Sunday, 1 to 5.30 p.m. So again, very excited to be at this point, to be offering this uh, to the community. Uh, there'll be some other guidelines and procedures that people will see us asking them to honor when they come to the pool, and that signage will be out in front. Uh, so hopefully this will be something that's very comfortable and safe uh, and the people will enjoy. Next, as I just mentioned, is our swim le lesson offerings. Again, going back to several times when we've shared this information with the Parks and Recreation Board, we feel like this is an essential service and, and an important life skill to be offering to the community through Des Moines Parks and Rec. I can tell you the registration is open now. Birdland, Nahas, and Teach Out will all be locations for swim lessons and our offerings at those facilities are the same. You can see the six sessions that we offer and our projected time frame for the aquatic season at this point is Monday, July 6th, through Friday, August 14th. These six sessions match that window of time exactly. So again, if you wanna explore this more, if people are interested in this, please send them to our website. They'll be directed to our registration page and they can see the full menu of offerings available uh, right now. Fees are $30 for group lessons. And we do have our scholarship offerings available again this season uh, through GRASP and the Youth Recreational Scholarship Program where people who are eligible can participate in swim lessons for just $5. So again, very pleased that this is part of what we're being able to bring to the community. I'm excited to uh, provide for as many people um, who are interested in coming to work with us as part of the summer. Two other quick opportunities to share with you from aquatics. 
A new one for this season is a diving class. Now we feel like we've had some underutilized spaces and one of them is our diving well. And we've connected with a wonderful instructor who will be providing this at Birdland this year. This is $30 for a group session. So set up very similar to the way that swim lessons are and it'll be offered on a weekly basis. But participants would learn some basics like springboard diving technique and safety and competition rules. So again, something new and different in the way that we can continue to serve people uh, in an exciting way as part of their summer program and season. And last but not least is our aquatics fitness programs. So last year we were able to offer aqua body at Birdland over the lunch hour on weekdays uh, for the first time. We averaged double, di double digit participants uh, throughout the summer. So on the heels of that success, we brought back that class and we've also added Aqua Zumba. This will be at both Birdland and Teach Out Monday through Thursday. Now we do have uh, some alternating days where Birdland will have Aqua Body on Monday, Aqua Zumba on Tuesday, and then we'll have Teach Out with Aqua Body on Wednesday and Aqua Body on Thursday. This is information that's uh, on Facebook as well as our website. And one thing we want to take advantage of this year with these facilities is offering things at Birdland in that bigger space, but then offering things at Teach Out, which as many of you know, is an ADA accessible uh, facility to also have that be an opportunity for folks who need that access. The other opportunity that has been there for many seasons and we is there actually this season in greater um, uh, amount is our lap swim and aqua fitness. So on the right there, you see uh, our aqua bike. We also have an aqua treadmill. We have a, a lane designated for aqua jogging. And we know how many people uh, enjoy and appreciate the opportunity to lap swim outdoors over the summer. And that'll be available at all facilities. Obviously Birdland is our largest facility and traditional 50 meter lap swim. Uh, but then we have uh, our other facilities, uh, Teach Out and Nahas that will have a shorter uh, lane opportunity for people to lap swim there as well. And you can see the times Monday through Friday, actually a morning and then lunchtime offering. And then Saturday and Sunday, uh, late morning or over the lunch hour. Four dollars to enter uh, for all of these fitness activities. Uh, so that's a consistent fee if you're going to take advantage of either the classes, uh, the aqua fitness or the lap swim. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share information with you. I know that was a lot to cover, but we're reactivating so many things. We wanted to get as much information to you tonight as we could. Looking forward to a, a fun, safe summer. Uh, with our community. I'd be happy to try and answer any questions about any of the information I shared with you at this time. Matt, I have a question. Um, you mentioned Summer Pickleball and you mentioned a number of different uh, locations. Will, uh, what day of the week will that happen and what time? So depending on the registration, it, we have two different models. We would have scheduled times potentially for people who want that, or we have a situation where people will contact each other during a certain window, uh, and it'll be, it'll be recommended that they go play at one of those facilities that's most convenient for them to match up. If somebody has specific interest in pickleball, they're welcome to contact our main office and talk to Tim Smith. He's our uh, athletic supervisor, kind of highlight more of the structure that we'll be using there. I know you're referencing the official times where we play pickleball at our indoor facilities, but we think this format for something like pickleball, and this is something that's traditionally used in tennis leagues as well, um, could allow the flexibility that people need to match up when it's most convenient for them. Okay, thanks. Good question, appreciate that. Any other questions? You covered a lot. Uh, <clears throat> does uh, anyone from the public that's listening to the meeting have any questions? You must have been pretty thorough, Matt, because we don't have that many questions. I, I'll tell you what, that was a good presentation. And uh, you, you covered a, definitely it covered a lot of area on that. The interesting thing to me was that diving uh, uh, thing. Now, can I still go up, take the class, and still go up on the high board? Absolutely, George. You can go first. That's right. I was going to say, I thought you were going to demo for everyone. <laughs> yeah, no, no cannonballs. Yeah, just sign, sign the waiver. Any. Yeah. 
The heat's not on yet, but you can go first. We haven't heated the water yet. So. Okay. <laughs> well, Matt, thank you very much. That was very good. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, I want to remind the board just real quick, George, too, that we've sent you the policies behind the scenes that are in play that we would normally do at the staff level. So you've seen the levels of detail we've wanted to, to make sure that we can control crowd sizes, the mayor's proclamation, the governor's proclamation, CDC guidance, and Iowa Department of Public Health rules that are in play. Those things are all very fluid. And I want to remind the board, I think you're all well aware of this, that even in your own professional and personal lives, there's not an owner's manual out there with COVID-19. So uh, it's a very fluid, fluid document. It changes. You've seen that as I've updated you as the board. You Three weeks ago, we didn't have a chance at a pool season. And then you know, less than 12 hours after we made that announcement, the governor came out and made that available. So expect more changes, but very done in a very safe way. A lot of these things are going to the city manager's office so he can talk to the council members too to make sure they're very comfortable and what we do. We just want to be careful of all the different things the city's doing to make sure there's a consistent message about people coming together. Actually, Ben, that's a pretty good intro for the COVID update. Yeah, I, I did not bring another presentation. I thought it was important to keep this on your agenda just to do general questions with the board. Uh, if you have any updates that you wanted a question further on or needed more details, that's what I wanted to just leave this on the agenda. It'll probably have a place marker for a while on our agenda just until we get through COVID-19. I can tell you, you know, from a budget perspective, the city manager is still working on what budget outcomes will look like because of less revenues all across the different revenue sources. Uh, that means that right now there's there's no right now no furloughs in parks and recreation because we've returned to work. There is a pretty good chance that capital budgets will be massaged a little bit. That means maybe Projects that we thought would be in 2021 or 2022 could be 2023. The city manager is going to work with the council and give us direction here over the next few weeks on what the budget will look like. At this point in time, it looks like most things are going to be affecting the capital side. And uh, just like everything else, that's fluid and it could change as well. But I want you not to worry at this point. The good news is it just means delaying something and we'll work hard as a group and we'll make some proposals to the city manager things that we all want to keep moving forward, like spray grounds and trail connections, things that improve the park score will, will happen, just might be a little slower than we'd all like. Thank you, sir. Yep. Any questions for Ben regarding that? Well, as we move on, we have some people that this will be their last meeting, and I, and I think that we'll start with Jennifer Shares. Jennifer is actually moving, and so, not only will we miss her, the uh, Drake Park area will miss her. She was very instrumental in getting things done over there, but she's moving outside the city. And uh, so Jennifer's not here today, but I do uh, want to wish her well. And then we go to Heather Anderson that's on the school board. Now, this is kind of a unique story. Her husband and Heather, they sold their house. They did this all in a 30-day period. She is resigning from the school board. They sold their house and everything, and they're both going to teach in Japan uh, starting in the fall. So that's a big step in life, I would think. So we want to wish her and her husband well in what they do. And then last but not least, we have a person present that has a lot of respect with our board, is involved with many activities in the city, and has been on the park board several years, Kimberly Bogus. And I will tell you, anytime we have anything political, you'll see her face. She is so active and very, very active in, in a lot of areas, and we're going to miss her. So, Kimberly, I'd like to have you say a couple of words. <laughs> well, thank you, you guys. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. No, actually, okay. yeah, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Okay, good, good, good. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Councilman Bill Gray. I don't think he's on here, but he appointed me about six years ago. Uh, Chair Davis, it's been such a pleasure to to sit next to you uh, and for so many years. Uh, ben Page and all the pa Parks and Rec staff, thank you so much. Um, Rebecca, I want to thank you for the many years of always getting what comes out of my mouth right, even if it makes no sense. You are diligent at keeping those notes. So thank you. Um, 
it would be foolish for me uh, not to point out that our city is having some challenges right now uh, and that I know it will take hard work, determination and exceptional leadership to chart a new course forward. It has been a great honor to serve on the Parks and Rec. Uh, one thing that I've learned in this role is that no matter who you are or where you come from, there is always a way to get involved in this community. Uh, for people out there, uh, find your passion, whether it's urban conservation, sports or recreation, environmental education, uh, or volunteering, and the Parks Board. As you move forward, I wish you good luck and always strive to make Des Moines a more inclusive and equitable city. Thank you. Kimberly, well that, was a, that was a very big decision to, to move on and, and I would appreciate everything and anything that you are involved in in the future. You must keep us posted. Thank you. We will, we will miss you. Thanks for all you've done, Kim. And Heather, if she's listening or hears this later on, and Jennifer, that you've all been great. It's always hard to lose a park board member. I'll tell you just a quick fun story is that all three of them made the announcement within about a 36 hour period. And my phone rings, the city manager wants to know what's going on in the park board. Why are all my park board members all dropping off real quick here? So I got called to the principal's office real quick. Had to explain, wait a second, it's not because of us. So. <laughs> I do wish you well, Kim. I hope that your next adventures are exciting and I know you'll be out there using the trails and you'll be at our volunteer events so you won't be too far off. Thank, Thank you. you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, do we have any reports from the boards? Uh, Andrea, Vicki, anything from the urban conservation? No, we have not met. I didn't, I didn't think they would at this time. Is there a projected meeting in the future? Uh, t not yet. Okay. Vicki, do you have anything to add? I mean, unless you've had other conversations. I thought we were going to try to do July, but I don't know yet. So we'll we'll see. I'll just tell you right now that uh, we've given the green light to have this exact type of meeting with our subcommittees, and you're going to hear a little bit from your golf committee members that they've already had a meeting last week. So anyways, be on the lookout for those to start wrapping back up now. Uh Cindy, Mr. Pugh, any uh, any comments on the uh, Golf Advisory Committee? I have no comments. Mr. Pugh? Sam is not on the call today, but I know, Matt, you hosted the meeting. What's a brief summary, Matt? What did the Golf Committee talk about? Yeah, thanks, Ben. It was just good to get everybody back together and touch base with uh, our golf, golf operator, uh, Ned Chido, and hear more about what's been happening there at the courses. Uh, obviously, one of the things that really made it through and was able to operate pretty much the entire time uh, when other things were shut down was our golf operation. And so golf numbers are actually a little ahead of where they were. And one of the benefits here of, of having golf um, be open was we've uh, gain some some new customers new golfers so we're excited to engage with a bigger part of the community through our golf program um, but we had a, a group of um, eight member board members there our committee members i should say and then some other members of our c-core team um, who just uh, again good to touch base and, and connect and talk about the season coming up because there's still a lot of golf to be played so that was good okay thank you very much uh, Joel, anything on the cemetery? We're scheduled uh, to meet July 8th. Okay. Did George, I'll note that the uh, city council did pass the chapter 34 rules about two meetings back. So we're officially done with those until they need tweaked again. Good, good, good. Sarah, Jim, anything trails, greenways? We are, are scheduled to actually meet in July, but working with, <clears throat> excuse me, with Colby from Des Moines and Adam from Polk County, I have a couple of things. Uh, first is the Ruan connector from Gray's Lake to Waterworks. There, at least a couple of weeks ago when we got the update, they were expecting to be done by the end of July. I don't know if Ben has anything different than that. Still on. Uh, the Carl Voss Trail, which is Des Moines River Trail Phase 2, um, is only about 25% paved. I think we jinxed that last fall when we thought it would be done. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, they currently have like four weeks to finish uh, less than that now until the end of the month, basically before there's damages. So it's probably going to be into the fall before that's completed. Um, the Neil Smith trail North of Euclid is uh, they're doing some work on that based on uh, trying to realign the trail to get it to be uh, 10 feet wide. Uh, and then the trestle to trestle trail replacement of the bridge over Beaver Creek has run into a couple of uh, obstacles in trying to get FEMA money to help fund that replacement. So they're going back to try and see what they can do there. And the Gailey Wilson Trail is going to be closed sometime in July for some stormwater wetland uh, work south of Broadway. So those are the updates. I thought I read. Uh, I thought I read a uh, a bulletin that uh, the uh, connector with uh, Gray's Lake and Waterworks was going to be open the week of July the first. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, a few things that have to happen behind the scenes on uh, clearing up all the final payments with the agreements in place with the Waterworks Park Foundation in the city. So whenever those things get, get resolved, they can get a green light to celebrate and dedicate that facility, but it's totally on their side to clear up all the things that they require to do for their agreement. Okay. Ben, do we have any, uh, is there, has there been any park damage or anything that uh, we need to be aware of? You know, we had a couple of storms roll through in the last three weeks that have been pretty strong winds. So parks folks have been out there really picking up a lot of limbs, some trees, some things like that. Uh, thankfully, you know, flood watch is continuing on. Ron's our, our flood guru, and he's keeping a close eye on that. We're in good shape there. So for the most part, uh, from, Na from Mother Nature, that's the issues. We have had some um, graffiti and some, some minor damages and some, some significant damages from some of the protesting things that uh, can be handled internally, mostly graffiti though. Uh, broken windows here at our new Columbus shelter was on the very first weekend of the protest. Um, we're gonna continue to see a few of those things wrap, uh, come up and down a little bit. I'm as my, my guess right now until the protesting is uh, solved, if you will. Okay. Okay. Um... I want to remind everyone that our next executive board meeting will be Zoom, and it's uh, July the 8th. That's a Wednesday, 7.30. I'd like to have everyone that's possible there as we set the agenda for July, and would love to have anyone's comments or participation. Uh, once again, Kimberly, I want to thank you so much, and uh, Wish you luck in whatever future you have on, on your events. Thank you so very much. Um, with that being said, Ben, is there anything additional that you have? There's not. Would you like a motion, George? Oh, would I? <laughs> would I? Hey, hey, hey George, back, can we back up? Do we need a receive and file motion on item C? Oh, I'm sorry. Good, good point. <laughs> just, uh, for the, just for the record. Yeah. Boy, you guys keep me honest. Um, so moved. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. And that will pass. Uh, let's go back to the motion that was just about had. I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned, and thank you very much. Have a good evening, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Congratulations. Bye. Congratulations. I'll stick a picture of something.